Can sound inspire us to think differently? We'll take you to places you'd probably never go. Remote, unfamiliar, not very appealing places, yet ones that are exciting and reveal much about the future challenges posed to our society. Ones that are rich in sound. Do you sometimes feel oversaturated by the images of climate collapse that are omnipresent in the media? We've seen them so many times, it seems to have become the new norm. Let's experience something different. Driven by the hope of gaining a new understanding of the natural and political processes that will impact our climate future, we venture on a sonic expedition that brought together philosopher of technology Lukasz Likovchan, musicians Václav Havelka, and Pan Torarensen, and audio field recordist Sarah Pinheiro and Magnus Bergson. Equipped with special microphones and a sensitive approach to sound, they'll allow us to listen up close to the various ecosystems and ambivalent technologies that define our time. We now invite you to join us. Future Landscapes, a podcast on the challenges of humankind as heard in sound. Over eight episodes, we'll visit an oil drill that slowly keeps digging in the middle of fields, Iceland's newest hydroelectric power plant, a futuristic looking and sounding aquaponic farm, steam hissing from a geothermal power plant, underground CO2 storage that promises to turn this dreaded gas into stone, a lagoon formed by the splitting of a glacier, a grazing reserve for ancient species, a coal power plant, and an active volcano. These places basically create a model of our world. Fossil Injustice, Episode 1. The Coal Power Plant in Tushimitsa, Czech Republic. At the beginning of our expedition, we find ourselves in an area allotted for gardening that neighbors the coal power plant. It's located right next to the open pit area formed by decades of mining coal, which is then fed into the plant's furnaces. Here, with a view of the smokestacks that diffuse coal dust, people are growing plants. The power station looks quite modern, and it's hard to imagine it might close down in the foreseeable future. In the current energy production conditions caused by the war in Ukraine, facilities like this in Europe are once again being celebrated as a guarantee of energy security. Field recordist Sarah Pinheiro goes and puts a contact microphone on a pipe. It's really nice that uh, when you have all the mics on, like the sense of the place is, is extremely hyper real. Like mm -hmm. uh, you hear exactly what you hear when you don't have the headphones on, plus all the additional uh, layers of the sound that are unveiled by the contact mic and by the other mic you use for the EM field. Mm -hmm. And this sense of hyper reality, I guess, is like great to actually understand these hidden layers of the infrastructures. There's something you should know about sound. In essence, it's a wave of mechanical vibrations that are traveling around us. So even though it's not visible and often goes unnoticed by us, it has the unique ability to connect all animate and inanimate objects in the world into a network of relationships. There are no borders here. So from this perspective, hearing something is a way of touching it no matter how far we are from the object. You might be wondering, why bother with this coal plant in the middle of nowhere? The fact is that this location is not void of life. People live here too. At the edge of the plains of the open pit of coal, you can find two apartment blocks and a shop that's gone out of business. 
In general, the inhabitants here are the widows of former power plant workers and socially excluded citizens. The bus stops so little here that, despite their low incomes, they have to take taxis to do their shopping. And, a few hundred meters from their homes, the power plant smolders silently as the rusting pipes crisscross over space. I'm surprised with the dynamics of the, pipe. the pipe because sometimes there is nothing happening, so to say, and we hear kind of uh, emptiness. Mm -hmm. And then it's almost like a flow comes mm -hmm. and you get these textures that yeah. could be interesting for you, for instance, mm -hmm. but are interesting to listen to. Yes. And then nothing comes again. And with the Electrolush, what I'm kind of happy about is that, you know, because the, the, this electronic humming that we get, we get almost everywhere and it, the variation is very reduced. Sound is endowed with infinite potential, and it's only up to the listener to open up to its abundance and navigate through its many winding and often unsuspected paths. We might try to immerse ourselves in the sounds of objects, which can tell us a lot about the functioning of our society and help us learn from the experience. Back in the gardening area, Standing by the entanglement of pipes is Lukash, a philosopher who is fascinated by technologies and the politics of infrastructures. His earphones are connected to Sarah's microphones, and he can now closely listen into the bowels of the pipes. What he hears serves as the starting point for his reflections on what is happening here. We can think about infrastructures as more like uh, capillaries of power. Those are the places or the veins through which the power flows the political power. That is not necessarily only about who rules the state, but also about who gives electricity to all the people in the state, from what source that electricity comes from, etc. So what I'm pointing at is that uh, the power of infrastructures is non-negotiable. That's how they actually gain their power. In a way how once they are at a place, it is really hard to opt out from the service they provide. And this non-negotiability, this aspect of not being able to opt out from the service they provide. It's also something that connects to the problem of injustice, that is related to where the infrastructures are placed, who are the people that actually, to some extent, suffer or are oppressed or experience some kind of violence related to the fact that the infrastructure, for example, causes the the emissions of CO2 and the other greenhouse gases, but not just greenhouse gases, also gases that are directly detrimental to people's health, to their lungs, for example, to their breathing system, to the respiratory system. That's the concept of the slow violence, the violence which is imperceptible in this way. And slow violence is something that is, I guess, invisible when we just look in the visual field of what we see. But it may be much more sensible in the moment when we hear. Canadian composer Murray Schaefer has dedicated his entire life to exploring the meaning of sound in social contexts. This is what he had to say. Machines share this important feature, for they create low-information, high-redundancy sounds. They may be continuous drones, they may be rough-edged, or they may be punctuated with rhythmic concatenations. But in all cases, it is the continuousness of the sound which is its predominating feature. This new sound phenomenon, introduced by the Industrial Revolution and greatly extended by the Electric Revolution, today subjects us to permanent keynotes and swaths of broadband noise possessing little personality or sense of progression. The flat line in sound emerges as a result of an increased desire for speed. Now let's have a look inside the power plant. We're accompanied by the representatives of the company, who have no problem showing us around. The microphones don't seem to be subversive or pose a danger to the PR of the company, 
which is partly state-owned. Our guides, older men who have already retired from their jobs at the plant, seem to be proud to have been part of this technology giant for most of their lives. When they take us into the main machinery hall, the sound becomes simply overwhelming. It's no surprise that their ears were slowly damaged and they can't hear well anymore. He's like how, like 60 years old, maybe more, this guy who, who was showing us around. And he's wearing an earring because like he lost his hearing after all these decades of working here. That's again like coming back to the physical aspect of sound, how it really like can alienate you if you're not careful. Again, like making the choice of the environment, where you work, where you live, and how the sound you perceive and work with the space. So I'm surprised about not just the constant drones of sound, but also the vibration of the place. Everywhere we go, there's some kind of vibration. Yeah. On the roof, on the floor, on the steps, and even when we went to the chimney. And the vibration is caused by different aspects of the, of the slip. It sounded more violent than it actually looked. And this overwhelming aspect of the sonic environment is uh, something that connects very well to this kind of insidious sense of the infrastructure mm -hmm. itself. It seems like, at the first place, the very existence of this power plant is a political decision. Politics is not outside of the plant, it is inside. I mean, It's the, it's the very politics. Yes, exactly. Like when you talk about the sound of the coal burning, that's the sound of politics. In the Czech Republic, a country that traditionally relies on fossil fuels, there are 10 other power plants of a similar kind and size. Altogether, they produce 40% of the energy consumed by the country. They're mostly located in areas that were abandoned due to the mining of coal, which was then burned in the plants. They're out of the everyday sight of the majority population and therefore go unnoticed and unheard by most. The same goes for their main byproduct, CO2, which also remains invisible. I was very surprised the first time we got out because I thought, okay, it can't get louder than this inside. It was so loud and full and everything. And then we got outside and I look at the recorder and the, the <laughs> levels were like peaking all over. It was literally the sound of the space. And I was really surprised. How can it even get louder than what it was? But this long exposure to this much information, it's really overwhelming because after some point, you, you don't know anymore. Let's get back to the thoughts of sound scholar Murray Schaefer. Increase in the intensity of sound output is the most striking characteristic of the industrialized soundscape. Industry must grow, therefore its sounds must grow with it. That is the fixed theme of the past 200 years. In fact, noise is so important as an attention-getter that if quiet machinery could have been developed, the success of industrialization might not have been so total. For emphasis, let us put this more dramatically. If cannons had been silent, they would never have been used in warfare.
because the inertia of the world infrastructure is so massive that actually it prevents the political action to smoothly facilitate the transition. Yeah. And instead, it postpones the world process by its inertia. That inertia is not just about the fact that the power plant still sits here. It's about how it gets into the minds of people who decide exactly. about about these things. Because uh, for them, it is much easier to keep it running because there are a lot of stakes in actually financial stakes, for example, to have this running. The relation of sound and power is something Schaefer further develops in his book, The Soundscape. Loud noises evoked fear and respect back to earliest times, and they seem to be the expression of divine power. The association of noise and power has never really been broken in the human imagination. It descends from God to the priest, to the industrialist, and more recently to the broadcaster and the aviator. The important thing to realize is this. To have the sacred noise is not merely to make the biggest noise. Rather, it is a matter of having the authority to make it without censure. The environment is a medium for realization of your individuality. And you can be proud of how you actually change your surroundings as an individual by choices that you do. And I think that's something that we need to slowly deconstruct to actually understand how much of our choices are predetermined by systems and actions that are not in our own capacity to be you know, somehow steered or influenced. Because the steering happens at a level which is you know, more general. And that's the reason why we talk about politics of infrastructure, to so talk about these generalities of the unavoidable choices and pre-setting of possibilities, pre-setting of options that we have. Because choice is one thing and the options you have to choose from is another thing. And it is by no means uh, random what choices you have at your disposal. It is preset by actually how the terrain of the decision making is shaped by these infrastructural settings. When we finally get out of the power plant, it's a hot summer day and the wind is still. The hum of all of the machines that together form the power plant is carried far across the landscape. We wander away from the main gate and find a prefabricated dormitory nearby with rundown cars standing at the front of the building, all of them with foreign registration plates. Some kids are playing, although there's no playground. There are no shops or cafes either, making this place only a site for sleep and work. The power plant has created its own microcosm. Another perspective on the same problem is that uh, people understand consequences of their action, but they think the risks related to these consequences can be socialized and that actually they don't have to care about these risks and about these consequences that much. But the problem is that with malfunctioning public infrastructure, then what happens is that you run into disaster sooner or later. Because if you socialize risk, but actually the society has no medium of risk mitigation, you end up actually you know, slowly destroying the very foundations of the society. You've just heard the first episode of Future Landscapes, a podcast on the challenges of humankind based on a sonic expedition into the ambivalent technologies and ecosystems of the Czech Republic and Iceland. You can find much more at futurelandscapes.cz. Stay tuned to this podcast for more sonic journeys.